first, the last lecture. I, I, I might, depending on if I have time, I'll, I'll write another lecture on how to do the, or a lecture, a little presentation on how to do literature uh, search and literature um, reference managing, but we might do that next week as well. Uh, but it would be, would be cool if you could use it for the project report this week, actually. But anyway, let's delve into it. All of you must have written at some point in your university career a report. Morning. Is that correct? So, might be a bit of a repeat for you, but I want to um, concentrate on certain issues about the formalities of that report that are extremely important in order to write scientifically. Well, extremely important for you to get a good mark, obviously, first of all. <laughs> Uh, but to write efficiently and scientifically, and not only the report this week, but ob obviously the report later on uh, in, in your MSc, and everything, in fact, that you're going to write from, from, from this day on. Um, so, Calvin and Hobbes make clear what basically the undergrad uh, approach to that is, namely to confuse the reader, that's what we're not trying to do, we're trying to do exactly the opposite, um, or we're doing that on a very high level at least. So, the format of any kind of scientific uh, publication, <coughs> and everything I say now, apart from an essay specifically not for this project, this counts for this mini-project, so you will have to do all of that your, this week, okay, by Friday. So, you, you produce a front page, which usually have your name on, title, Abstract, introduction, methods, results, discussions, conclusions, references, and an appendix. And I go through all of them, apart from the front page. The front page is straightforward. The general structure and content is you have to answer four questions. The whole thing is grouped and ordered around questions that you have to answer. Okay, first question is why did I bother? So why did you do the experiment and why is it important? Second question, that's the introduction. Second question is the methods. How did you do it? How did you carry out the research? Third question is the results. What did you find? What were the results? And the fourth one is the discussion. So what? What, what does it mean in terms of the hypothesis? And what contributions do you make? Morning. Cool. Okay. The title. Morning. You may wonder why I go into the detail with the title, but I think the title is extremely important. Find a computer. I still haven't repaired the ones, although I sent them about 12 emails by now. But you don't need a computer today anyway. You only need one per group. Um, what, 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 why do I go into the details with the title? It's very straightforward, because in the real world of science, about 99% of the readers don't get past your title. And in general, you want people to read what you've written. Why? Well, you really don't want to. You want to do it because you get a mark. But in anything serious that you're doing, you want readers. Because you basically everything that you write is not only a piece of science, but also an advertisement for yourself. So everything that you write will be hopefully later on published in a, in a, in a conference or maybe in a journal. And if you, if you stay in academia or if you stay in any kind of researchy type environment in your clinic, you want people to read your stuff because your name is connected with it and, and people listen and after a few years you get a reputation and all that. So you want to advertise. The whole thing is basically a, an exercise, an advertisement, what I tell you here. And the title is the key to all of that because 99% people don't read past it. So you need to capture people and you need to alert people just by reading it. And um, what should it do? It should basically tell the whole story in one sentence. That's the difficult bit. It shouldn't be too vague, it shouldn't be too specific either. I've got some examples from last year. Some of them are, uh, are slightly better, some of them are, are worse. But all of them are kind of all right. I always like the, the uh, titles that split into two sentences. So you say, for example, the first one, localization ability, that's what we're measuring. That, with that, it is clear as hearing, it's localizing, it's all sorts of stuff. It's already clear from the two words. Does the extent of differences in pinner size from a chemo ear affect percentage of front-back localizations error made? You can argue with the grammar, 
Um, but you can't argue that it actually tells you already what, what, the, what, it, what the topic of the, of the research is. So a title can be a question. Uh, it can also be an answer already. That, 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 that is totally allowed. Okay? So it's worth spending a bit of time of, 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 of uh, thinking about that. Okay. Um, front page. Ah, that's why I got the course. That's the, the, the wrong lecture. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Um, this is the lecture that I gave to the BSCs when they submitted their research report. It's, it's the same content apart from the front page. Okay. You're basically um, doing exactly the same research report as anybody else, but you're, you have to write more, more into detail, obviously, and you're a har harsher mark than them. That's the difference. But otherwise, same thing. Um, yes, that, that's what I want you to put on the, on, on the front page. Um, but um, let's not get into detail with that. Um, ignore that, please, for the time being, okay? Because you, you have a lot of more formalities that you have to fulfill. The BSCs just, just submit a softbound copy of their report and you have to do everything possible to get into the library. So you have to do a hardbound copy later on and there is about that much text of formalities that you have to adhere to. But we'll come to that at, in, in about November, okay, when it's relevant. Okay. Um, uh, content page is not for the report on Friday, but for the report later on. It's quite useful to have it. Um, you don't need a list of figures and you don't need a list of tables. It is said that you need that in some publications, but this is from the time in the 70s when people were writing their dissertations on typewriters and attach all the figures at the back. That's why it's handy to have a list of figures. These days, I hope you don't need to do that anymore. So, list of figures, list of tables are completely superfluous in my book, and therefore d d don't do that. But a, uh, uh, the, the, the content, so <coughs> chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, is useful. Okay. Abstract. Always the most important and the most difficult bit of all. Um, I, I try to teach the, I, I teach sound perception for the engineer students. And um, one of the things that I try to do there is try to teach them a little bit how to write scientifically. A little bit, because they are from A-levels and they have no clue. This is really cute how they, they have no way how to formulate a sentence without equivocation and ambivalence. Um, so I'm trying to send them to, to, to write an abstract about something that they've written. And they failed so miserably that I've completely given up on that. That's how difficult it is. This is just, you, you learn that you need a few years at university to actually learn to write an abstract. So this is, because it is so important and so difficult, write it at the end. Okay, Don't st you read it at the beginning, but you write it at the end. Um, my page limit here, or word limit, is about 200 words. That's, that's about that much, and that should be any kind of good abstract. Uh, for your actual thesis, you've got about everything up to a page, which is something like 400 words. Um, but um, here only 200. So you need to say, first of all, why is it so important, the, the, the abstract? Because from the 1% people that you get past your <coughs> abstract, you lose another 99% uh, reading your abstract. And as you know yourself from doing a literature review, you very often, most of the cases, you don't get past the abstract. The abstract should actually tell you everything you need to know. In a good way, uh, in a good abstract, it is described in a way that you really can decide do you have to, write, do, to read the, the paper or not. So, what, what do you have to know in order to be able to decide that? You need to know what the study is all about, so the background. The, what's the problem? What's the motivation? Uh, what kind of participants did you have? What methods did you use? What results did you find? And what did you conclude? So, all of these. So, it's about one sentence for... Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and se six sentences, and then you have your 200 words, m more or less. Yeah? So that's important how, uh, how uh, yeah, don't write too much in there, otherwise you, you easily extend your, your word limit. Um, it is important to write it last. Write it after you've written your, uh, your, your discussion, and um, think about it again, and that's the p right point. In general, the, the, the order of writing things over the years has turned out to be the, the easiest is to first write your methods because you've got them already. There's no thinking involved in the methods section. Then you write your results. Then write your discussion. 
because you then know what the results are. Then write your introduction, because the introduction needs to introduce what the discussion is all about, and then write the abstract. Okay, I'm not explaining it in this way, I'm explaining it the way that you read it, but as you all know as well, whoever reads the paper in the way abstract, introduction, methods, results, discussion? Probably not many, because it is not necessarily the flow that you want to do. Most people um, just look at the figures in the results section and then might read the, the, the discussion, depending on how well they know the topic. Some people only need the, read the introduction because they only want to know about the background. Some people only read the methods. And, and so you, you need to, it needs to be self-sustained in each part. Okay, there, there ought to be a story in between, but it is best if it is self-sufficient in each individual part. Okay, let's come to the introduction. As I said, write it last, but i explain it here first. Anyway, what do you need to do? <coughs> you need to provide the rationale. Um, the purpose is to explain to the reader the reasons why you did the study, what has been done, and why is the study worth doing. You need, that's the easy thing to test, you need to persuade the reader that there is a gap in the knowledge, which is extremely difficult for you to do this week because your literature review and your introduction is just very short, obviously, but still try, because it's very easy to find a question that isn't answered yet. If you find an answer to a specific question, it's not worth doing the experiment. That's why. So you need to explain to us what is the gap in knowledge. Why is it wh what's not known? And why is it important to, to know it? Your experiment, obviously, is, is, is helping to fill this gap in knowledge. Uh, in general, there can be four reasons to perform a study. One is to test the theory. That's very rare in our circumstances here in, in, in audiology. Quite often the case is to replicate or confirm an existing study, but you can't just repeat it, you want to do it better at least. To extend the findings of a previous research, that's most often the case. There is a study that you found and it said there are some open questions, we need to do the experiment with more conditions, something like that, and then um, that's a good reason to do a study <coughs> or resolve questions that have arisen in previous research. That's the most elegant way. Um, many studies, all studies, end with unanswered questions and other studies are useful to, to, to perform, to fill this gap then. Okay, how do you describe previous research? That's basically the, 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 the issue of, an, of a literature review. Uh, I'll give a, an extra lesson on specifically how to write a literature review. Um, but this is the difference between the literature review and the introduction section. You cannot just take your literature review and call it introduction session. They're two different things. They're related, obviously. The literature review is part of the introduction, but the literature review can be a lot wider. In the literature review, you're allowed to write anything that is remotely interesting to the topic. In the introduction section, you need to be uh, very specifically, you confine your, your, your material to anything that is only directly relevant. <coughs> okay, this is about conciseness. You're always running against the word limit. Can I say that? curly bracket open, you are restricted always by page limits or by, by word limit. In our case, I think it's 6,000 words. I said it somewhere there. It's about seven pages. That is not very much, and it is very easy to write more than that. It is always easy to write more. It is very difficult to write less. And the, the correlation between the length of a thesis and the mark is usually negative. You should know what that means from last week now means the longer you, you shorter you write, the better your mark gets. Yeah? Because it is difficult to write short. Because if you write short, you have at least read it again once, usually. Well, if, if, if containing the same material, let's put it like that. If you have two, two documents, one is five pages and one is ten pages, and they contain the same information, then the five-page one is ten times better. Yeah? That's why it's a difficult, and that's why you need to. That's why it's a difference between the literature review and the introduction. You need to cut out everything that isn't really relevant. Okay. Um, in the introduction section, you ought to outline your own experiment. Um, that's a bit artistic. You, you have artistic freedom here, but you should give the general outline of your of your experiment, but without too much methods. So, saying uh, th there is an open research question. 
And what we're going to do, we're, we're going to repeat this experiment, but we're going to use blonde subjects. And that is a little bit of an introduction. It gives the, the overview of what you're doing, but it, it just gives the motivation, but not the, uh, too much detail. Okay? You should provide a prediction. Um, that, that's basically the English way of saying it should give a hypothesis. So predicting the effect. I, I want you to predict a directional effect quite usually. Uh, but state your hypothesis in everyday English. That makes a lot more sense, but it should be, of course... Um, correct, so don't deviate on that, um, but you don't necessarily need to give the zero hypothesis. That's something that is on, on, on the level of what we are writing not necessary because it's quite, it is usually quite trivial what the zero hypothesis is. Okay, at the end of the introduction you can produce a cliffhanger in the way that, okay, now you read the introduction, now you want to really read on to find out what the answer to this question, this important question is that you've just answered just ask. Okay? So there's a lot of style here involved and you can be creative. That's the bit where you can be creative and, 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 and produce good writing in order to um, make it interesting to read. Okay? So the rest of the, the, the whole thesis and the report is pretty much formal but here you've got the, the, the possibility to be more of a writer. Okay, the methods. That's what I said we should write. First, that's straightforward. You need to provide the reader with a clear idea of what you did and how you did it. And in an optimal case, you should be able to re repeat the experiment uh, only on the information that is given there. That's the gold standard. Okay? Uh, you can imagine that requires, of course, an infinite amount of information, um, but you, you need to weigh it up with the important bits and what's not so important bits. Okay. Um, so what do you have to report just formally the design, what were the independent and dependent variables, how many which conditions, repeated or independent design, what was measured, that's the dependent variable, that's quite obvious. You need to talk about the subjects and participants, their age, gender, ontology, how you recruit them, any, only the relevant information, and not their names or heights or whatever. Um, Right, we, we usually call people participants these days because some idiot in the American Society of, of, of um, Psychology decided that subject is a derogative term. Um, but I don't really care. That sounds more maybe appropriate. You read participants these days more often. Don't say patients unless they are patients. If you talk about cochlear implant, Patients, they're not patients because they're not ill. We call them cochlear implant users usually, yeah? or hearing aid users as well. But subjects, honestly, nobody cares. Um, it gives me something here to say. Autology, how do you know? It makes a difference, obviously. Honestly, I, I hope everybody understands if you do an experiment, the difference if people are normal or they have a hearing impairment. But tomorrow, you just do an experiment with some people that are just randomly allocated. How do you know that they are autologically normal? Because they tell you. Okay? And you believe them. That's in per se not a bad thing. Be the only thing that you need to do is you need to be honest about that. And I'll repeat that in, in a few times. You will always have to be honest about how you get information. That's what you're marked for positively and highly. It is, doesn't help you if you say we had seven autologically normal people in our test because that would imply that you actually have done the whole BSA procedure. Well, if you have done, then you have to write it according to BSA procedure, blah, blah, blah. But if you say um, self-reported autologically normal people, then it's not your fault if they weren't. Okay? So you have to be just honest. That's what you get good marks for generally if you are just honest about what you, uh, what you did and why you did it as well. I mean, in this case, it's quite obvious. You don't have the time to check people, but it is a quite obvious criterion or a criticism criterion to say yeah, you have to trust people that they were telling you the truth. You don't know, effectively. But it's not your fault that you don't know because you, you basically pass the, um, the responsibility away by saying they were self-reported. That's true for virtually anything in these reports. Everything that you do justify what you're doing it, why you're doing it, 
and exactly be honest how you did it. Yeah, how did you recruit them? There's a keyword here. If you recruit them um, to tomorrow, um, it's called opportunity sampling, op op opportunistic sampling, because you basically just take the people left and right of you. You wouldn't believe how many studies are done like that. <laughs> Probably most of them. It's not a good way to recruit people, obviously, for sample bias. Um, but again, y y just, just don't, don't try to hide that fact. Just be, what's the word, objective about it. Because that gives the reader the opportunity to judge is, you, if you, uh, is your study well done or not well done. Or is it on a scale between 0 and 100, how well is it done? Okay. Good. <coughs> Stimuli and the apparatus give enough detailed setup to another, uh, enable others to replicate it. So um, you don't need to say that you were on a Dell Watson computer because nobody cares. Um, but which kind of, of headphone you use does matter because they've got a different frequency characteristic. So if you have the frequency characteristic, that would be ideal, but otherwise just try to give all the information that you, that you do. Here it actually says Sony MDR V150 and everybody can find out from the internet what, what frequency response they have. That makes a difference. If we use a Dell or a Sony computer, it doesn't make a difference to the stimuli. Okay, describe the stimuli that you use in reasonable detail, especially the amplitude, the length, what kind of stimuli, is it speech, is it noise, tone, what, what frequency, onset, offset, and so on, and so on. Um, explain head-related head transfer functions somewhere, otherwise, um, because you will use them, you don't know quite yet how, but it is actually explained, but I, I, I uh, g give you a bit of literature on that court for that. Uh, you might know about it already anyway. You need to, you're not going to use it in much detail, but you have at least to mention it, that your stimuli would present it like that. Okay. Procedure. How did you carry out the experiment? Number of repeats, order of subjects, intervals, durations. That gives you the chance to, to talk about your, your randomization procedures. So the Latin squares, for example, which you can also put in the appendix if you want to. That's a typical information that you don't really want in the main text because it's not important enough, but it is uh, something that m might be useful in the appendix. Um, how long did the experiment take? Did you give them a break? Things like that are important in order to be able to repeat it. What did subjects, I didn't, didn't say that, in the, in, the, in the apparatus stimulus, what did subjects do? You need to, to say that. Do they sit on, the t on a chair? Do they stand? Do they handstand? Do they have something on their eyes? Do they have a headphone on? Is the headphone closed? What are they looking at? If this is, are they looking at a screen? In our case, they're all looking at a screen. They're looking all at the same um, diagram and, and having a mouse and so just give the, the reader a feeling for what you actually what, what the um, what the subjects went through see it from the point of view of a subject okay that is also for this afternoon if you do the experimental design I'll, I just decided I'll send you a little um, uh, ba -ba -ba uh, word file through that actually explains how you do the, 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 the risk assessment ethics application. You, you need to write a little uh, experimental design and we can do exactly the same this afternoon where you have to go through in the, from the point of view of a subject what happens to them, how, how are they recruited, w what happens to them, what do they read, how are they informed and so on. That, that uh, I forgot here, I need to put that in. You need to inform subjects of what you're going to do, so you need to give them instructions. How do you give them instructions in a scientific experiment? Usually in a written form. Why is that? So that they all get the same instructions. Because if you explain it to somebody, you might explain it different to people. So you want to normalize it for everybody. That is a, what's called a, a, a subject information sheet. And that's something that should go into the appendix as well. Okay, so you have complete um, procedure is then uh, repeatable. Yeah, there's also in, 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 in the real world and some of there's a, a subject consent form that you also should put into the appendix and that you also need to, to, to give to the, to the ethics committee and to the risk assessment committee 
but we, we, we assume we, we don't need to do that here for this week. We, d we assume um, there is consent, otherwise you wouldn't. Yeah. Otherwise, just say no. Okay. We don't want to do something against somebody's will here. Right. <coughs> that was the, the, the boring bit. Th that you can write down probably this afternoon, and it shouldn't take long. How to report your results. That's, the, that's the, the interesting bit, because this is what the last week was all about, because this is where the statistics come in. Um, general, what, what you do in the results section, you, give the reader, you tell the reader everything that you found, but you don't go into the theoretical implications. Sometimes it's quite difficult. In, 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 on a level of a PhD thesis, you will always struggle to separate these two things, because you do so many things, and then you need to interpret them, and then you find something else, and you interpret it. We're not doing that here, because it's only four or five pages, six pages. Um, you split these things completely into two. You just explain what you found, and then you explain what it means. Okay? We have two kinds of statistics, the descriptive statistics and the inferential statistics. We first do the descriptive, then the inferential. First of all, you need to tidy up your data, and uh, you need to remove data dodgy. You need to remove outliers potentially remove outliers if you have extreme outliers. Extreme outliers are easy because you just say that they're dodgy data for some reason. In, in, in other cases, if they're not so extreme but there are still outliers, you need a really good reason if you want to remove them. In general terms, you should never remove anything. Hopefully you did the experiment good enough so that you don't have any outliers. But there will be some in many cases, and if that is the case, you need a good reason. The best reason to remove an outlier in our localization experiments if people have their headphone the wrong way around. Yeah? Because then they produce the reason, uh, results at 180 degree out. That's very easy to spot and would completely destroy your results. But you've got a reason, and this is why you need to watch the subjects, what they're doing, obviously, and maybe write down things as well about them. Because if people are uh, completely, uh, you'll find that out for yourself tomorrow, if they're completely unmotivated or uh, bored or something and, and, and uh, you might have a reason to exclude somebody because of that because they, they're not concentrated enough. Um, but you do need a reason, that's what I'm saying. You can't just eliminate any data without a good reason. But you can eliminate data if you have a good reason. Okay? But be always honest about what you did and why you did it. That's the point here, the, the, the crucial point. So, um, yeah, descriptive statistics. You need then to present a clear and succinct overview of, of, of the raw data uh, after you remove the outlier, I suggest, because otherwise you just get a double figure. Um, and the best way to, to report it is as a box plot in all conditions. That's straightforward. You, so you, don't have, you haven't done it, anything to the data. But you report the, the, the mean, medians, and modes, or, well, or whatever is appropriate at this stage. But if you report any of them, always give the dispersions as well. Um, so that's one set of figures. Always you need to do that. And always in box plot, always display the, the, the raw data. For everything that you do, that's not only Friday. That's your your, your whole um, your, your main report later on as well. Um, if you just just two slides about the presentation. Um, if you have less than two or three data points, you can put them in a text or a, a graph or maybe a bar diagram. If you have more than five, make a graph. Just decide what, what's most fitting. Some people put a table in with 20 numbers. Useless. There's no point. There's no information usually for the reader that is interesting, um, you don't need to do that, you, you should put that in a graph because you're much more interested in relationships between these things than to have the numbers, especially not if they have 14 uh, digits after the decimal point. So just be reasonable about that. Give the reader the information that is relevant and not the, all that you have. Your job is always somebody has to do the work, either the reader or the writer. You get a good mark if you've done the work as the writer. And you get a bad mark if I have to do the work as a reader. Okay, that's the general rule for everything. Okay, um, figures, all figures should be necessary for understanding. So there is a point of not repeating your, your, your data unnecessary. Uh, they should be simple, clean, and uh, free of elaborate detail. We practiced that last week already, so you should know how a good graph should look like now. Um, all figures should be labeled, figure one, figure two, table one, table two. 
all figures and tables must be referenced in the text, so no free hanging figures anywhere. They must have a legend and they must have a title. And make them big enough so that I can read them. And don't give me this uh, black background of stuff that is just un illegible. Everything that you plot must be somehow carrying an information. Okay? So don't, don't just copy paste a uh, Adobe Edition um, spectrogram, for example. Although it looks nice on the screen, it really looks crap on, on, on paper if you plot it in black and white. And um, it's, it's just usually the font sizes are so small that you can't see anything. So the general point, you need to, everything that you plot must be somehow legible and must carry information. Okay. Each label must be labeled, each, each axis must be labeled. Um, yeah, yeah, just, just, just make them reasonable. I trust that you can do that. Okay. Um, inferential statistics, that's what we practiced last week. Um, every hypothesis needs inferential statistics, ideally both ways round. Make sure that the reader knows what you're comparing and explain it twice, namely once in the form formal way that we practiced last week and you're allowed to say it also in, in words. Maybe better in the discussion section though but you, you're fully allowed to say we found a significant effect of uh, sound level okay, without going through the whole of the formality because you have done the formality already in the results section. Okay. That's all well, complete repeat from last time, from, from last week, what you have to report in the statistics. So just be careful that you have all of these things, including effect size, including power, and all that. You need to report the assumptions, data type, well that's hopefully ob obvious, normality, variances, sphericity. Uh, report what you do when they are violated, that might well happen next week, or next week, this week, if you find your data, they might well not be normally distributed. Uh, that in that case, okay, you say what you're going to do. We've been through that a number of times, so you, you try to make them normal, and if that, that all doesn't help, you need to do a non-parametric test then in the end. Yes, you don't need to reference anything for statistics. And that's all information that's useful for you. You can go through that later on, and you should do, because there's some uh, um, information that might make your report much better. Yes, make the reader's task easy, is what I said. Um, either you do the work or I do the work, and it is better if you do it in, in, in advance. Um, always explain in words what the results of a graph show. Don't put up a graph of saying, scatter plots of results. That doesn't help. Um, first of all, I see that it is a scatter plot, so you don't really need to say that anyway. But if your if if, 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 if title would be correlation between um, hearing loss and um, error rate, that's much more useful. Okay. Um, it, as the rule of thumb, if, if you take out all the pictures, all the figures in, a, in, a, in the results section, it should still be understandable, and vice versa. If you only look at the figures and the legends, it should still be understandable. You are allowed to repeat yourself, yeah? There's no reason not to repeat yourself, for a number of reasons, um, but this is one of them, because of self-sufficiency. Okay? That doesn't mean that you should repeat yourself over and over again, because you should be concise, obviously. But because readers don't read everything linearly, please make it easy for the, for the reader. Yes, be selective, less is often more. Never, ever, 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 ever put any statistical SPSS output table into anything. Okay? That is an immediate fail. Epic fail. Um, I say if necessary put them in the appendix but there is, I've never found a way where it actually is necessary to report that so don't, just don't, okay? The SPSS is a tool, it's not something that is actually worthwhile in itself, it's just a tool to give us a few numbers that we then have to report properly. Okay, abbreviations for your perusal later on they're all defined, if you talk about the p-value you, you say it's a p and Ideally, you even you, um, you, you make it uh, italic. 
Um, th these are all defined ways to, to, to talk about or to, to write these things. Now to the more interesting stuff, to the discussion. That's probably the most difficult to write. Um, so at this stage, readers should know all the results or they have jumped in. At this stage, in which case it is helpful to actually repeat the results, come to that in a second, you need to tell them here what that means and how do they relate to your hypothesis. And actually at the fourth point, um, w w as also the criticize your experiment is, is, is vital important here. Okay, first, the first paragraph of your discussion is um, the repeat of the principal results of the results section. So assuming attention span of a goldfish of the reader uh, is the same as allowing people to jump in at any point and to just start with the discussion section, just repeat what you've just found, but without any statistics or stuff. By the way, in the abstract, also no statistics and also no reference in the abstracts, okay? Well, I, I should have put that into the abstract bit, but there is no statistics or, or references in the abstract generally. Okay, back to the discussion. Relate your findings to previous research. That's what the discussion section is for. Now, in the introduction, you raised a few questions. You put up a few hypotheses, you open the brackets, and in the discussion section, you close the bracket by saying that's what we found and this is what we, um, what we think about it. Uh, is what we found in accordance with what we predicted? Contradiction? Or does it favor one model or theory against another? And everything that you have discussed in the introduction need to be discussed here as well. So every open question needs to be answered. Um, and so this is your chance to, to, to shine. It's the only part of the, of, the, of the report where you're actually free to write what you think, what you uh, creatively. You can make new theories. You can have, you showed insights into the data. You make new comparisons, uh, uh, things like that. Okay? You're not allowed to do any of that in any of the other chapters, only here in the, in the, in the discussion. So that's how formal it is. Don't start introducing radically new ideas. If you do that, go back to the introduction and introduce them there first. Okay, next step, discuss the limitations of your study. What, what methodologi methodological problems did you have? And there are always some. In this room, if we, if we measure sound perception in this room, there's always a background noise. You need to write that somewhere. But not only that, what I want you to do, generally, is justify and do it as good as you can. So how loud would you think is the background noise? How would you describe the background noise in this room? It's people talking, fluctuating noise. <coughs> At what level? 100 decibel? your experience? 60 decibel? <laughs> it's not as loud, no. You should have a feeling for that. That's what I want you to understand. You need, you need to get a feeling for these things. The background noise here is about 50, 60 decibel roughly. Maybe, maybe <laughs> between 40 and 60 because it's fluctuating. Roughly. Everybody who has done audiology testing knows that because you have a feeling for how loud 40 decibel is. I hope, I hope you have. If not, then go back and get this feeling. This is all what it is about, okay? You need to give me your best estimate of things because I don't want you to go back and get an audiometer and actually measure, not the audiometer, a sound level meter. You could go and, and measure the background level. Great, but everybody can do that. But because of your experience, you can tell me with, forcefully, you can tell me, I estimate the background noise around 50 decibel. Now, that's brilliant, that's good. Okay, I can believe you that, I cannot believe you that, that's my choice, but this is what you estimate and this is your, as, as good as you can explain the situation. That's not, this of course for the experiment, this is a, a real problem, a methodological problem, but that's why you have to write it. Okay, what about generalizability? That's the um, thing about um, internal and external validity. I, I, I'm sure you know what that means. If not, look it up. Um, 
but we, you need to explain both. You need to explain why your experiment had internal validity, so it was a good experiment, and why it had external validity, so how it generalizes to the general population. Uh, here you can talk about the experimental power, saying that you needed more people to find a significant effect. Um, but, but not only criticize your experiment, not be, be self-critical, but not self-abusive. Because I don't want to know if you are crying and because you didn't find the results because it was also bad. But what I want to know is what effect these limitations had on your results. So I want just to know that you can think. Because if you say the sun was shining and that had an effect on our results, I don't believe you. So you need to justify that. Okay? Always justify why that was a bad thing. Okay, and the last thing, make suggestions for further research. What questions remain unresolved? Uh, motivate questions that could go in, in the future. What, 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 what would be good to do in the future? Whew, that was it. It's a long lecture, longer than I thought. Um, next is just finish the whole thing by writing conclusion. Two or three uh, bullet points for what were the actual results, what, what do you conclude from that? So it would be good to re re repeat the results again, and maybe one bullet point, and another bullet point, what does it mean? Okay. Okay, that was it. That's all that you need to do. And now I tell you what you need to do to get a, f a, a, a distinction. Um, you need to adhere to everything that I said, obviously but you need to also adhere to some formalities. So, um, I don't really care what word processing you need. I hope you use a computer and not a typewriter. Uh, but everything you should um, you, you submit from now on should be at least in 12 points. That, sorry, not time to roll your room. I actually like Arial. Anything readable, okay? Don't give me anything curious, but anything not smaller than 12 points and one and a half line spacing. If I say six pages, I don't mean that you fill all the, the, the edges and everything to make up for words. That's exactly the wrong way around, okay? This one and a half line spacing is just very useful for feedback. And every time, uh, if, if students give me something very small, I hate it because I can't actually write anywhere in there. Uh, that's not useful for anyone. So d just do that and everybody's happy and, and uh, you get a better mark. No use of color, I say, um, because you need to give me ten reports, I actually don't care. And I mean, now, Nowadays, these printers are all in color, so if everything that you do, uh, you print out is in color, it's fine. Um, but usually, you, you need to expect that people actually copy your work in, on a black and white copy machine, and then it needs to be all understandable in black and white. So that's the, the, the test. You can't reduce anything in color, but if you copy it in black and white and uh, the, the information is lost, y you have a problem. Put your name on top of every page. Put your, if you give me something as a file, put your name in the beginning of the file name. Put down page numbers. You wouldn't believe how few people are able to do that, actually. But find it out in Word. I'm sure you can. It's very helpful. If, if I lose... I've got a pile of, of, of this much, and, and very often uh, papers fly around somewhere, and I need to get them back into order. You wouldn't believe how useful it is to have page numbers. Okay, just for style reasons, if you use abbreviation, explain them at the first usage. Don't overuse them. And if you, um, y you're allowed to use the whole word, word again later on, just to remind people what the abbreviations are. And it's, if you do use a, a number of them, a table is, is a good idea at the beginning. Don't use emphasis. There's usually no need for it. And I mean exclamation mark. There's absolutely no need in science for exclamation marks, ever. Emphasis usually means capitalizing, and not capital, capitalizing as well, uh, it, italicizing things. Uh, but there is very rarely a need for that. Right, references. Now, this is a whole lecture in itself, obviously. Um, this is the overview. I mean, this week I expect only about five or six references, so you can easily do them by hand. So you don't need a reference manager for that. Uh, but feel free to use one. Um, references are crucial. Why? Um, everything, third step here, you have to cite a source when making a statement that is not obvious or your own. If you say anything that isn't obvious or your own idea, you need to put a reference from somebody who said it because it isn't your idea. 
That's the general idea, okay? If you don't do that, it is plagiarism. And that's very bad. Um, plagiarism is not only the number of, of, of things that plagiarism constitute. Did I talk about that? Um, one is obviously you just copy paste something from a paper without referencing it. That, that's, just, that's just illegal. <laughs> the, the, the second worst thing is you, you paraphrase something from somebody else's paper by putting in a few sentences or putting a few words. Um, that's still very, very bad. Um, the easy way to get around that always is, if, if, you, if you just can't help it, is, is to put quotations marks around it and they say, who, who is it from? You're still allowed to do that. You can copy whole paragraphs from somebody's paper mm -hmm. as long as you put quotation marks around that. You don't get any good mark for it because it's not your work, but at least it's not illegal. What we want to do, what we want you to do, is to tell us in your own words what an idea is from somebody else because that's the way that we know that you have understood it and be able to repeat it even and that gives good marks okay um, yes if you how we always in, in audiology or in all social what are we social and natural sciences um, not in, 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 in engineering but it, it, it doesn't really matter very much how we reference things is, is like that if you have it in, in the text you say this is somebody else's idea and you say in brackets then Lackless 1994 okay so always the name and the year the, the engineering way of doing that is putting a, 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 a square bracket with a number in but in, in these days, this is just to click with the reference manager, so it doesn't really matter that much, but this is the way that I prefer it and, and that we should all use, okay? That's the way that they, they that's it's called ASA, ASA, American Society of, uh, I don't know, something, who defined that and everybody's using that. Okay. Um, just for, for, your, for your information, if you don't use a reference manager, this is how you should do it if you have a journal article, a book, and a chapter in a book. And if you do use a reference manager, use the ASA style, and it does that all for you. But my experience is you always still have to go through the end and check that it's doing it appropriately, because there's quite often wrong abbreviations and things that um, it picks up from somewhere. Okay, that's formalities. Um, appendix is totally allowed, doesn't count to page limit usually. Just don't expect somebody to read it. <laughs> so don't put any important information or important figures in there. Um, but for, the, for your report later on, um, it, it must have your ethics application, your risk assessment, example of consent form, pa participant information sheet. That's all the stuff that is just relevant to understand what you have done. Okay. Um, it can be the raw data if, if you insist that it is very important that you give people your raw data um, then you, you're allowed to put it in the, in the appendix but usually I wouldn't um, um, and this is, was meant for, the, for your actual uh, project later on uh, all the information that you, that you collect during your experiment must go on a CD or a DVD to your supervisor later on not this week, this is for September. Uh, this is for, for uh, ethical reasons, because your work is effectively published, and there is a law that says if, if we publish your work, which just goes up in the library, we must keep your data for 10 years. So um, have a good order of stuff, because it's very often with the MSC projects that we, a few years later, go back, want to see these results, because we have another project based on that, or we want to write it for a paper, for example, so it's good to have a good order of these things and to have it all uh, on, on one CD. Okay. Right, here are a few things about uh, style, if, if there are any uncertainties about that. Write in the past tense throughout everywhere, apart from if you state something really obvious. So the law of gravity still holds. <laughs> Um, but in this experiment, we tested it in the past tense. Okay? Uh, do not use I, we, or my. That's, do not overuse it, I would say. Never use I, but you're allowed to use we. We did an experiment to do that. 
Okay, that's allowed, but just don't overdo it with that. Try to write around that, that's a good style. Uh, always place a name and date when referring to previous research, everything else is plagiarism. And do not quote people without referencing them. Our university gets very upset about it. Um, make sure any factual assertions are substantiated with a reference or your own data. Okay, don't make any sweeping statements. So it's always good to reference textbooks. By the way, what I didn't say about the referencing, if you reference textbooks, and obviously for, for standard stuff, textbooks are good, uh, give me the page number for it. Okay, because it is useful if you check something, it just doesn't help if you say um, Brian Moore said that somewhere in his textbook because that, that you can't really uh, check that. Provide a full reference list, obviously. Um, reference manager helps with that very much. Try to be in mind that your reader knows nothing about what you're doing. That's not quite true. You write it on a scientific um, level. I always thought I thought for a long time what that actually means, writing scientifically. And I, I decided it means write concisely um, in a way that every word counts. Everything that you write, every word counts. And if you read through a sentence later on again, very often you think, what do you want to say in that sentence? Very often it turns out that either the whole sentence is irrelevant or can be shortened by two-thirds. Um, by just leaving out superficial or repeated or just wrong information. And that's what I mean with scientific. Try to read it, the general, the golden rule, once you've written it, try to read it again from the point of view of somebody who, who doesn't know anything about it. Uh, and you'll be able to shorten it and make it much, much better. Always. Okay. Yes. That was that. You got any more questions about the report? Friday report. Have I completely gobsmacked you with that?